some folks listening to this and, and are maybe curious or, but they're not convinced they should own any. I mean, I think that that question has already long been settled because, you know, Bitcoin is now a, essentially a bona fide asset class. I mean, it has the backing of BlackRock, which is the largest asset manager in the world. Um, where there is a, a generational bias against crypto that those who are against it tend to be older. And that's because um, the traditional financial system suits them well. And maybe people know stocks and bonds and they might know gold, but they don't really know if they care for this digital thing. Just point out, I think it's easier to have conviction on the longer term price than a shorter term. Um, because in the short term, there's a lot more factors beyond fundamentals that affect, uh, you know, a price of anything that has, that trades on a market. And, and, you know, for instance, just recently, everything happening out of Germany and Mt. Gox is, is creating short term headwinds and, you know, potentially even breaking technical patterns, but it doesn't change where Bitcoin should be five years from now. Tom Lee is a prominent figure in the financial world, renowned for his bullish outlook on the market. He's the co-founder and head of research at Fundstrat Global Advisors, a research firm known for its focus on disruptive technologies and their impact on the economy. In this video, Tom Lee shares his outlook and predictions for Bitcoin. Known for his consistently bullish stance, Tom has frequently expressed his confidence in Bitcoin's potential. In several interviews with CNBC, he has maintained his position that Bitcoin could reach $150,000 by the end of 2024. Tom also discusses his view that Bitcoin has the potential to become the most valuable asset, surpassing gold. He notes that institutional adoption of Bitcoin is still in its early stages, as many major fund managers have yet to include Bitcoin ETFs in their portfolio offerings to clients. However, Tom believes this will change, particularly with the recent support from Larry Fink. As the CEO of BlackRock, the largest fund management company in the world, Fink's endorsement could significantly influence institutional adoptions. Tom's insights suggest that the increasing institutional interest, spearheaded by influential figures like Fink, will be a game changer for Bitcoin's value in the coming years. As we bring you clips from the interview, take a moment to like the video, subscribe to the channel, and turn on post notifications for more video like this. You can join the conversation by dropping your thoughts, comments, and observations in the comment section below. Everything you do helps with YouTube algorithm and immensely contributes to the channel growth. Thank you and enjoy the video. Um, but uh, the price target of 150,000 is actually based on work from our head of digital strategy, Sean Farrell. And he's looking at a combination of uh, his essentially what looks like a, st a stock to flow model and a essential, like basically a price to book model. You know, what, what is Bitcoin cost to produce and what is that break even and what multiple should you assign to that? And he triangulates to 100, 150,000 roughly by the end of the year. And I, I think that's pretty achievable. I mean, it, it really, principally only happens if the S&P actually can rally into the end of the year, and that's our base case. And, you know, if someone's asking, you know, why should they be interested in Bitcoin? Like, so let's say you have some folks listening to this and, and are maybe curious or, but they're not convinced they should own any. I mean, I think that that question has already long been settled because, you know, Bitcoin is now a, essentially a bona fide asset class. I mean, it has the backing of BlackRock, which is the largest asset manager in the world. Um, Larry Fink, even today, was speaking post earnings about how important Bitcoin is to the future of BlackRock. And it's something that they're encouraging clients to adopt. I think that people, the mistake someone might make if they're interested in Bitcoin is thinking they have to go 100% of their portfolio into it. They only need to put 2% or 5%. And, you know, if you think about someone sitting on cash, that's like one year's worth of interest on their portfolio. They just have to dedicate to crypto. We made that recommendation when we first wrote about Bitcoin that they should put one to two percent. Today, if they didn't rebalance that recommendation, um, it's 80 percent of their total portfolio. Bitcoin isn't um, peaking. You know, it's not that widely adopted yet. There's still so many skeptics. And, 
you know, there's many financial firms that are restricting their clients from having access to exchange versions of Bitcoin. So the ETF today is not even approved for many firms. And it tells me that there's still a lot of future holders of crypto. And I think the mistake someone could make today thinking Bitcoin's not relevant is the financial system does work really well in the U.S. for wealthy Americans. But even in America, I think, I think only 45% of Americans actually have a bank account. And another 25% consider prepaid credit cards and debit cards as their primary form of banking. I mean, it, banking is very expensive in America, and that's for one of the wealthiest nations in the world. Outside the U.S., you know, crypto is really going to prove to be a much more low-cost banking system for folks, especially if they want to do remittances and move money around the world. Do you think there's a limit to how high Bitcoin could go? Maybe a sort of a minimum sort of target for Bitcoin. You know, like, hey, when does Bitcoin have to reevaluate whether it's peaking is when the value of Bitcoin exceeds the value of above ground gold today. And that's 16 trillion. Mm -hmm. And the reason I think uh, that's a, a fair benchmark is that, you know, gold might have some industrial uses and it has jewelry uses, but the principal reason it's got 16 trillion of value is it's viewed as a sing almost a singular hedge against currencies and yeah. against calamity. And to, to me, Bitcoin is far more resilient and useful if we were ever in a circumstance where you actually need to start using gold. I mean, you know, if you try to, you know, carry a million dollars worth of gold, you know, that's, I mean, that's, yeah. you probably need a couple of friends to help carry that. You can carry a million dollars of Bitcoin in a, in a, on a wallet or, you know, right. in your, in your mind, if you can memorize um, your, your address. So to me, I think it's, it's a far more useful hedge against calamity. But on top of that, of course, it has other uses. In fact, you know, over time, it's, you know, arguably going to be pretty widely used, maybe not for direct payments, but as a, as a source of collateral or type of collateral. And mm -hmm. so I don't know. So, I mean, it'll be some multiple of what gold is today, but I would say reaching 16 trillion seems somewhat reasonable. And if someone is skeptical of crypto and now you see um, in, in a presidential campaign, one of the parties supporting Bitcoin and even accepting donations in crypto. And, and it's not we're not talking a fringe candidate. You know, it's it's someone who betting markets think has a 65 percent chance of becoming the next president. Um, I, I think it's a huge deal. And um, it makes a lot of sense because Bitcoin is already probably quite widely used by many government agencies anyways. Um, I think that's what people forget is that they think Bitcoin is only used by like pirates and drug dealers. And, and you know, that's not the case. I, I'd, I'd say it's probably only 15% of all network activity today. Yeah, I mean, I think some of that takes time because, you know, I'm sure you've noticed and a lot of these listeners have noticed that there is a, a generational bias against crypto, that those who are against it tend to be older. And that's because um, the traditional financial system suits them well. And maybe people know stocks and bonds and they might know gold, but they don't really know if they care for this digital thing. But what people forget is that the global economy increasingly, you know, the growth in GDP is increasingly native digital. I mean, AI is, is actually proving this. I mean, all of the value creation in AI isn't in the physical world, it's in the digital world. And is it an overestimation to say that in the next 10 years, 75% of all incremental GDP is native digital? If it probably is, then do we need arcane definitions like local currencies and, um, I mean, why wouldn't it be a digital-based money is actually the preferred way to, to actually settle payments? So I, I would say to me, it looks like as time passes, the, this generational objection is going to disappear. I think Bitcoin's blurring, but even what the definition of money is, you know, um, I mean, it's already blurred the definition of, of like, of community benefiting from holding something. Because, you know, uh, in a traditional financial system, let's say you take Amazon and you have Amazon customers and they contributed to the growth and 
the fact that Amazon is one of the largest companies today, you know, it's really the customers and the loyalty of the community of buyers and sellers. But the only people that benefited from that are actually the shareholders, the ones who actually provided the capital to Amazon. So it didn't create value for the community itself. I mean, Bitcoin is so different, right? Because Bitcoin is benefiting those who are actually holding it and using it. Um, what is your take? What do you say to the people that are feeling very bearish? I'd understand why people are bearish because, you know, the Fed essentially was planning to give the economy a heart attack by raising rates at the fastest pace ever uh, to kill inflation. And how the economy fared was a secondary consideration. Um, but here we are more than a year after the last hike and the economy's actually doing pretty well. So you're, 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 there's an expiration of the risk of a recession. And I've been following markets for almost, or actually for more than three decades, believe it or not. And um, so I've experienced and covered many recessions. Um, Recessions rarely happen when, every, when markets are all saying a recession is imminent. Uh, markets participants aren't that smart. So the fact that so many people think a recession is imminent, and, it, and we see it. I mean, we do many meetings with clients, institutional investors, that view recession as their base case. Hmm. I mean, that, that, that would just mean everyone suddenly is a great forecaster of the economy. And as you know, nobody can forecast the economy. We don't try to forecast the economy. But the only reason we think a recession is less likely is because everybody thinks a recession is likely. Um, but logically, there are things weakening. I mean, I, I guess I'm not going to try to ignore it. Um, we know consumers are, are running out of excess savings and the job market is getting softer. And we know housing has, has become a very difficult market. It's unaffordable. And then there's parts of the country where there's a huge rise in inventory. Durable goods spending, like on appliances and cars, I mean, it's absolutely tanking. I mean, used car prices are going to fall a lot. And there's an inventory correction. I mean, there's been a lot of destocking of excess goods inventory. Those are what's causing the slowdown. But the mistake I think anyone will make is to say, oh, well, that means this is going to lead to a recession. I mean, number one, housing, durable goods, and inventory are all extremely rate sensitive. So the minute the Fed starts cutting all of those reverse, but second, the bond market, credit markets, corporate bond spreads, quality spreads, things that you think should be blowing out if there was a recession are absolutely mid cycle. I think what the mistake people think is they have to buy a whole Bitcoin and come up with, you know, $63,000. I mean, they can buy a Satoshi, a, a Satoshi every day. Um, instead of a latte. And more importantly, you know, if Bitcoin network value plays out in Bitcoin, yeah, let's take Urian's number, but let's say Bitcoin is a million. Okay, so it's a 20 times increase from here. Anyone who's long Bitcoin won't care about inflation, you know, and that's the important thing because it's really just the dollar getting cheaper. It's not, I mean, that's really what they're experiencing. There you have it, Tom Lee's insights on Bitcoin, digital assets, recession, interest rates, and the future trajectory of it all. According to Tom, the future of Bitcoin looks exceptionally promising, especially for younger adults who have the potential to hold Bitcoin for another 40 years and witness its growth as a premier digital asset class. What are your thoughts on Tom Lee's discussion in this video? Please share your comments and observations in the comment section below, subscribe to the channel, and give this video a thumbs up. Thanks for watching.